think we can get started. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Grant. I'm a program manager for the City of Palo Alto Utilities. Excited to host this webinar today in partnership with Bosca and having Juanita as our instructor. Gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, one second. Okay, so as you can see, all attendees are muted by default. Um, we will pause for questions at the end, but throughout the presentation, you can put questions into the Q&A box. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will also have an opportunity for you to raise your hand so that um, we can have you ask Winita your question directly. And the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Bosco website and we'll be sending a re um, the link to that recording in our follow up email as well. So Bosco represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, water company and university, all that purchase water from San Francisco. Bosco member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses. Bosco's goal is high quality supply of water at a fair price. Um, the Bosco is really focusing on outdoor water use because it represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bay Area. Um, outdoor water use through the use of water efficient native plants and innovative techniques can really help us take the next step for saving water. So that's where this landscape webinar series really focuses on. Um, if you live in the Bosco region, so this is, um, I'll get to Palo Alto rebates in just one second, but for other Bosco member agencies, Bosco offers a Lawn Be Gone rebate program where you can get one to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced and a rain barrel rebate program as well. Bosco also has a smart controller Ratio um, installation program, and they recently started a rain garden rebate program. To find out what your agency um, provides, go to bayareaconservation.org. If you live in Palo Alto, we partner with Valley Water on our landscape rebate program. So we're really excited that we recently increased the rebate amount for our landscape conversion rebate. So you can now get up to $5,000 and that's $4 per square foot of lawn replaced. So the, you're gonna learn so much from Juanita on how to do that. And then you can get up to $5,000 to help with your project. We also offer rain barrel rebates and laundry to landscape as well. For more information on um, how to save water in Palo Alto and the rebates available, go to cityofpaloalto.org slash ways to save. We have some, um, Bosca has one more upcoming webinar on November 8th for integrated pest management and natural pest deterrent. And then here at Palo Alto, we are continuing with our one water plan, looking at all of the different supply options and conservation with long-term planning process for the city. So join us on December 6th in person or virtually to add your feedback for that important long-term planning process. For more resources and videos, Valley Water um, works with South Bay Green Gardens, where there's a lot of information here that you can find out for irrigation, gray water laundry systems, um, Valley Water's WaterWise Outdoor Survey Program. So feel free to check out those videos and resources. In addition, um, Bosca's BayAreaGardening.org has a lot of great resources and watering guides on different types of plants. And Bonita will going into um, more detail of other resources out there, such as Calscape. Um, I, other thing I just wanted to mention is at Palo Alto, we recently launched our WaterSmart portal. So this is a portal that you can log in and view your bill's monthly water use. It also provides you with personalized recommendations of actions you can take and rebate programs available to you. Um, I'll be putting the link to 
our website, um, how to get to Water Smart in the chat. Um, now I'm going to introduce our instructors. So Juanita Salisbury has a PhD um, in biopsychology from the University of Florida, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture. In 2009, she established Juanita Salisbury Landscape Architecture after working for commercial and residential design firms. She has recently turned her focus to California native plant pollinator habitat and established the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, the first of five pollinator habitat gardens in Palo Alto. The gardens combine her educational background, the biology and behavior of food intake with design expression born from landscape architecture. Her focus is to research and educate about these habitats, as well as exploring opportunities to install more of them. Uh, Juanita, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks very much, Linda. All right, I'm going to share my screen. And we'll start the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lawn Conversion 101. Um, as Linda said, um, I am a California licensed landscape architect um, and scientist. Um, and um, I do take care of, uh, design and take care of a few native uh, pollinator gardens here in Palo Alto. <clears throat> and you can uh, follow the progress of these gardens. Um, uh, we call ourselves the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden on both Facebook and Instagram. I have a YouTube channel, Primrose Way. And um, if you don't like social media, I have a website for you to go to, which is the primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com. The five gardens are always open. Um, this is Embarcadero Road along here. Uh, Primrose Way is the was the first garden. And uh, along Embarcadero, we have the Gwenda Street Garden, this is Newell Road. Uh, there's the Hopkins Avenue Garden, Arcadia Place Garden, which is a cul-de-sac, and then the Island Drive Garden. Great resource to go and check out what native plants look like when they have lots of room to spread out and show you what their forms are, their textures, their colors, how they look all during the year. So great resource right here in Palo Alto for everybody to uh, go and take a look. Tonight, I'm going to talk about a lot of broad concepts. Uh, I talk a lot about broad concepts because not every situation is the same. I can give specific examples, but those are not necessarily going to work for everybody. Although I will be including specific examples of things that I have done that work here, at least for me, uh, in Palo Alto. So within that framework, we're first going to talk about form following function because we're, you got to, you just can't just plant things. You, you got to think about how you're going to do it firsthand. Then we're going to talk about water and mowing because we're going to get rid of those lawns. We're going to talk about how to get rid of the lawn, what some lawn alternatives are, what some of the trees and native plants that can go in in place of the lawn. And then we'll talk about maintenance issues and, and why that's all very important. And I do try to liven up the, pic, the uh, slides with the various pictures that I take of the insects that I see uh, in the gardens, or as I like to say, the consumers of the native plant buffet that I provide for them. So first of all, let's think about decisions big decision here. Do you actually need a lawn? Do you really need a lawn? How often do you use it? So, and what would you use it for? Consider where you're walking, where you're sitting, where you're planting, playing, etc. Because we want to design around function. Okay, so, um, and when I think about function, I think about movement through a space. And so, do you actually need a big swath of lawn? And everybody's circumstances are different. So I can't answer that question for you. So that's a question to pose to yourself. Uh, how are you going to use your area, your front yard, your backyard, your side yards? What are you doing there? What do you wanna do? Um, 
so, you know, as I said before, one of the functions of a lawn is a walkable surface. This is probably the, the most functional aspect of a lawn is you can walk on it. Uh, the dogs can run on it. The kids can play on it. If it's big enough, you can play baseball on it. But here you have lawn on either side of a pathway. Um, you're not walking there. So you have a place to walk. So why is this lawn here? You know, these are these are these deep questions. You know, um, what do you do about the little creatures like dogs and children who want to use a space like that? So what are your alternatives uh, if you don't want a lawn? We want to optimize um, our decision making. So we want it to be the best decisions that we can make. So um, again, look at function. This is how you, you make the best decisions possible. We leverage those decisions in terms of what we're going to put in those outdoor spaces. We know that outdoor irrigation accounts for most of a home's water use. Lawns can use up to 50% of that water, so it's a lot. Um, you know, and mowing, mowing intensively increases weeds and lawn pests. So people think their mowing is going to get rid of weeds, but it doesn't actually work like that. It works in the reverse. So, um, you know, really think about the function of these spaces, whether it's, you know, I mean, sometimes it's just easy to roll that sod out and you're done, but then everything else that happens afterwards may make you reconsider why you went that way in the first place. So one of the things that I do as a landscape architect is I design irrigation systems. And so don't get afraid of this slide. Um, basically what it is, it's um, this example graph here, which is from the Codes and Standards Research Report, California's Residential Indoor Water Use Report, second edition, 2015, which shows what an average new three bedroom home would use per year, about 46,521 gallons per year with various fixtures and appliances using certain amounts of water. That's the interior. Now I had a client who had a three, three bedroom, two bathroom house and um, I designed an irrigation system. And so when you have a new house in some municipalities to get your permits okayed, you have to submit a water budget calculation. Um, and so for this particular client, there's in this first column here, we have zones. They had nine zones. What that basically means is that they had nine valves, okay? The valves that control water going into the yard. And we had um, those zones put into categories of water use, low, moderate, um, you can go to high. We didn't have any of those. We just had low and moderate. Um, and for each of these, we had a plant factor, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, but the takeaway from this particular graph, and it looks very um, scary, but is these numbers in the boxes. These were lawn areas. And what I calculated was Overall, the, the outside of the house was using over 63,000 gallons of water per year, still within their water budget, um, definitely more than the average, uh, what an average home used. But in calculating everything, I discovered that the lawn area in these boxes, in terms of the estimated water use, was using over 28,000 gallons of water or 45% of the total irrigation water, but was only 19% of the landscape area. So it's using up most of the water and it's not even, you know, the biggest part of the, of the lot outside. So, you know, it's, the, they were within their water budget, but still that's a lot of water. So uh, what, are the, what are the ways that we can um, cut down on those numbers? Well, it really helps to know uh, how much water plants are using. And so one of the resources that we have, and this is how I just determined whether they 
categories were in very low, low, medium, high, so, so forth. Water use is by using this water use classification of landscape species, which is an online searchable database for plant factors. I'll tell you what that means in a second of individual plant species, and it's published by the University of California, Cooperative Extension, and the California Department of Water Resources. Here's a link to the site. Short term, we call it Wuckles. And plants can be ranked based on the percent of water use of turf grass. So the plant factors basically are a percentage of turf grass use. If turf grass is what you would consider 100%, then plants that are very low water use are zero to 10%, low water use, 20 to 30% of uh, regular turf grass and so forth. So you can figure out how much water a single kind of species is used and then decide based on these numbers. So this, you know, you need information to make good decisions. And so this is one of those ways to really help you make the best decision possible because this is the best information that we have uh, in our toolbox for water use. Let's talk about mowing for, for a minute here. I, I have a little tiny meadow area where I have native grasses. I don't mow it. I actually take a pair of hand loppers out and trim it occasionally. It looks very natural. It's not flat top lawn. It's just basically these fluffy native grasses. So lawn mowers and leaf blowers. Gas powered mowers, um, this is done by uh, the Air Resources Board here. And what, they, what they're showing you is that an hour of lawn mower use is the equivalent of driving 300 miles in your car from LA to Las Vegas. That just amazes me. Gas power leaf blower, one hour of use is even worse. Okay, there's a lot of, in addition to these smog uh, forming pollution chemicals that come out, there are all these other chemicals that happen too. You have gasoline spills, you have um, all kinds of volatile organic compounds coming out. You're kicking up dust. You know, it's just, you know, we're not supposed to use gas powered blowers in Palo Alto anyway. Um, and eventually, um, I think there's this, a new law coming uh, in effect in 2023 or 24 that no new gas powered lawn mowers will be sold and gas powered leaf blowers. The old ones, people are still gonna use those, but we have to move uh, to electric to uh, really cut down emissions. And in fact, um, another part of this graph that I'm not showing, but it shows actually that the output from smog from cars actually goes down over the years. and if we don't change what uh, the gas powered uh, lawn mowers and leaf blowers are using, they'll actually put out more smog forming pollution than cars over time. So, you know, we want to, we want to like try to make things better, not worse. So try to use electrical uh, devices when you can, just to get rid of those, uh, you know, the carbon monoxide spewing out and the bad fumes and all that sort of things. Plus, Electrical equipment is just quieter, which is also a good thing. Noise pollution is a real uh, issue in the environment. What's a lawn alternative? Let's he's just like, all right, let's just get rid of the grass. I still want a walkable surface. What can you give me? Um, this was a design I did for a client um, where it just made more sense to have a big area. This is decomposed granite, which is basically uh, crushed granite rock and she had we embedded a few stepping stones within the granite so if they wanted to walk barefoot they could and they wouldn't be stepping on rocks. This is still a very nice permeable surface you can plant into it if you want um, you know but it still gives you that nice walkable surface um, as you can see you can plant into it because we did actually add a, a tree here um, so that is one alternative where you're not planting a ground cover of some kind. Another option, now remember we talked about walking on lawn. Um, and so walkable spaces, if you wanna walk someplace with your bare feet, outdoor rugs are great. Um, you can put these also on top of decomposed granite to have something soft for the kids to walk on. 
um, for sitting and, you know, you roll these things up, put them in the garage during the rainy, rainy season. Um, you put them out on the deck, you know, they're great for defining spaces. Um, you know, it's an alternative. Again, you know, what is your function? How do you want to use the space? Do you want to be able to lay in the sunshine, you know, and you don't have a lounger, uh, outdoor rug might, might be just the ticket. Um, you can also do decking. So lots of, lots of alternatives to give you places where you can walk. Let's get rid of that lawn though. So let's talk about sheet mulching. So let's say we're gonna plant, we're gonna get rid of that lawn and redo it in new plants. So one easy, simple way to get rid of your lawn is to do sheet mulching. And this is a great resource, uh, lawntogarden.org, where they go in detail how to sheet mulch, which is basically layering cardboard right on top of that grass and then putting compost and mulch on top of that. What that does is it smothers the lawn, it decomposes, all those nutrients go into the soil, and lawn is gone. And so you're done. Great way to get rid of those uh, Amazon delivery boxes if you get a few of those or people want to get rid of those. Um, cardboard. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here um, because these websites give you such a better in-depth education on sheet mulching that you probably will like be an expert on it going through these websites. Um, so you don't even need to dig up that lawn at all. Um, it's a lot of work to dig out a lawn or to spray it with chemicals. We don't want that. Um, instead, the easy, 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 easy thing to do that's way better, um, you know, again, cardboard, um, compost, and then mulch. You know, and you can push back all those things, break a hole in the cardboard, dig a hole, and plant right in it so you can create an instant garden. Um, so that sheet mulching is one of those great tools in the toolbox of transformation. Um, and if you mulch on top, mulch is really attractive, I think. Um, this is a, a mulch that's called mini bark mulch, a little bit higher end of the uh, a mulches, but you can see how nice it looks. It gives you that nice sort of uniform, clean look um, instantly. You know, you spread down a couple of inches of this and um, it gives you this beautiful clean slate. So um, just is, you know, and it, it smells, it smells good too. Um, so it's all good. Now, if you say, but I really want grass. I, I want a lawn. What's, what are my options here? So if you want grass, California has a lot of native plants, like thousands, thousands of species. We also have a lot of native grasses. And there is a company that can give you a native grass sod blend, and that's Delta Bluegrass Company, which I personally use all the time uh, when I specify native lawns. And uh, they've got the native mow free, which means you don't have to mow it, and you end up with this really fluffy, soft, uh, beautiful green um, meadow kind of lawn, which looks great. Um, there's another kind, the native bent grass, which is a grosses palins, um, and you can mow it. It looks just like a regular grass, non-native sod lawn, um, and it uses about a third as much water as a regular non-native uh, lawn does. So, you know, an option. If this is, if you have to have that, have to have that grass, um, this is an option. You know, as I said before, I have a small meadow where I have native grasses tucked in. I'm always like, I just seeded in before the rain some of the uh, festuca, um, uh, festuca rubra, the uh, malate fescue, so to speak. I just throw the seed down and I pop in a few other grasses. I have little strawberry plants coming up through it, violet, native violets. So it's more of a meadow. Uh, look. Um, so options, you know, native bunch grasses, you know, again, think about where you're walking. This is a, a great friend of mine who has a wonderful native plant garden, and she's created some pathways, um, but she still has some native bunch grasses in through here. Um, you know, for the, the strips between 
the sidewalk and the driveway, you can do, um, you know, some bunch grasses, you know, for places that maybe you don't want shrubs or something like that. Um, you can even do an, ugh, a non-native ground cover like thyme um, in between uh, stepping stones. Again, places where you can walk can take foot traffic. So lots of alternatives for lawns. Now, if you're you're still looking, you're okay, I don't want grass. I don't want, you know, like this or that. What else is there? Um, one specific example, and this might work in your yard, um, is Achillea millifolium, otherwise known as yarrow. And you can walk on this. It takes some foot traffic. Um, you can mow it if you want to. Um, Usually I just, we and we have this in our gardens. I usually just deadhead um, the plants when they're done blooming um, and just leave it because it doesn't get that tall. Um, it's clumpy, it spreads by runners. It can take um, shade, which is great. And it hosts like uh, 10 species of butterflies. So, you know, why not? Um, butterflies and moths. Another option, now here in Palo Alto, we have some great resources. In addition to the uh, pollinator gardens at Eleanor Party Park, there's some uh, drought tolerant demonstration beds. And this is uh, the Festuca glauca um, showing in there. And you can just see how pretty this is. If you like a nice cool color scheme, like with the blues and the greens um, and the violets, this is a, a great option. It just has that kind of, uh, you know, soft kind of look where you feel like you could roll around in it if you want. But there are other options over here at Eleanor Party Park. Um, I recommend people go and check it out. It's it's a pretty cool uh, demonstration garden for those drought tolerant options. Now, if you don't want to walk and you just want a swath of green, you just want it just to look green. You don't care about mowing it. You don't want to like have to do much to it. You don't have to water it hardly at all. Um, a native plant ground cover alternative is this one, Ceanothus thrissiflorus, Yankee Point. Um, evergreen, uh, about 15 inches tall and spreading. It grows pretty fast. Great blue blossoms in the spring. Um, can take uh, some sun, uh, loves full sun. Can take a little bit of shade, super low water. You, in fact, you can kill this in the summertime by watering it too often. In fact, once a month, maybe in the summer, you could probably get away without watering at all once it's established in the summertime. Um, some people like to do what, what is called the Las Palitas dust off, where they just spray off some of the dust and grime midsummer. And that's pretty much it. And the bonus, 79 likely butterflies and moths hosted. So great for the environment, low water use, feeds a lot of uh, various pollinators. It's all good. Another option, again, you know, so many, um, is this is at the Primrose Way Garden. This is a salvia, a sage called Bees Bliss, and it grows very rapidly to about eight feet across and will continue to grow in diameter. So it needs a large space, but it's a great ground cover alternative for lawn. If you don't want to if you don't want to walk on something, you just want a big swath of continuous green. Um, this is a great plant. Um, tends to look a little desiccated during the summertime, um, but in the spring and fall and winter when it's a little bit cooler, um, it is nice and green and very fragrant. Yet another ground cover alternative. Uh, one of my favorite for shadier locations are the native strawberries. And these I tuck in everywhere I can, and they're easy to propagate. You just take the strawberry and you tuck it where you want more plants. And the strawberries taste like um, candy. <laughs> so, um, and I love to forage for food and snack on things when I'm outside. So it's a great plant. Yet another one, another alternative. So this is at the Primrose Garden as well. And this is Sissyrinchium bellum, or blue-eyed grass, and it's not a grass, but a member of the iris family. It has blue blossoms in the winter, as you can see, here's a bumblebee on one of the blue flowers. Um, in the winter and spring, it will bloom sporadically throughout the year. Super easy from seed. I mean, literally just seed where you want this stuff. 
and then it'll self-seed itself where it's happy everywhere and it's fire resistant. So a great plant looks just like grass, but you get blue flowers. So yet a, another option. And we actually cut this back once a year um, and it just sends up new, um, new growth pretty much instantly. It's very vigorous. So why am I talking about California native plants? Um, and so this is the biology portion of the talk. Um, California is a biodiversity hotspot. And so this will take us into leveraging biology, the power of biology to save water. And California has almost 8,000 species of plants, some found nowhere else on the planet, more than any other state in the United States. Many of our species are, are drought tolerant because they evolved here in California where we don't get very much rain in places. Um, we have a lot of native bees here. Um, and so that is uh, very helpful. And um, let's see. Um, Insect species are declining worldwide. So it's just, it's just really good to have uh, the native plants. My computer did something weird there for a second, which distracted me. So plants, plants are the beginning of everything. Um, energy from the sun is converted by plants, what they call the first trophic level. And basically what that means is food. Um, and then that is then eaten by insects and other animals, second trophic level, so on and so forth. So um, what we know about plants is that as a rule, native insects only eat native plants they evolved with. Why is that important? If you don't plant native plants, you're not feeding the local fauna. You're not feeding the local animals, the insects, the birds, the lizards, um, because that energy from the sun can't get into the food web except through plants. And the plants can't transfer that if they don't have those insects that normally feed on them here. And non-native plants don't have those insects here. Um, and so that's why you want to plant natives so that you can transfer energy into the food web. So I see plants as uh, not as uh, decorations. Plants are decorative. They're, they're kind of pretty. Um, they have pretty blossoms. They smell nice. They have pretty textures and colors. Those are aesthetic qualities, but their actual function is to be food, to feed something. And so when you plant native, what that means, and this is a guarantee, your garden will attract many native pollinators and other insects, and then in turn, birds. It, it cannot fail to work. I mean, in, in all of our gardens, we have seen an explosion of insect and bird life. And I've been I've been monitoring these gardens since 2016, um, almost weekly. <laughs> I, need, I need to have more, uh, more of a, I need to get out more uh, rather than do all this all the time, except so entertaining, but anyway. Um, so native plants are critical parts for sustaining life. You end up with um, these larvae, you're going, oh, bugs are eating my plants. That's good. You want to see plants that are getting eaten. This is so counterintuitive to people. This is how I pick out plants in a native plant nursery. When I see plants that are all chewed up, that's the one I want because I know I'm gonna get butterflies and I love seeing butterflies. They're beautiful. Why not have some beauty? Um, why is it so important to see native plants as food? Um, because that's what they are and um, they will attract these uh, insects to your garden. It's a guarantee. So because of this attraction, you don't want to make your garden into an ecological trap, okay? And this is part of like, um, okay, you planted the plants and now what? Now what happens? This is the, that part, what happens? So an ecological trap is something in the environment that attracts organisms. And because of this attraction, makes it easier for them to be killed through predation or other means. So like, for example, if you're using pesticides, not good because you're, be, you're going to be killing the things that you essentially, because you're planting native, have invited to eat in your garden, like these beautiful butterflies and these beautiful bumblebees. Um, the chemicals get into the soil 
where the bumblebees and 70% of our native bees will nest. And these organisms, so this is the other part of saving water with biology, these organisms store water in their bodies. So that water in your garden is in these organisms. And that's the best use for water is to keep it in living tissues. And so whether it's in plants and then the plants are conferring that moisture into other organisms, it's doing its good stuff out in the, out in the food web. So um, in your native plant garden, you're starting to get an idea. Everything is connected. And um, the, these connections are enhanced by, by native plants. And the more connectivity and complexity that you have in these gardens, the more the plants support each other, leading to reduced irrigation needs. So less water use doesn't mean less plants. You're thinking, you know, uh, does this mean I can only plant like five of this or three of those? The answer is no. Um, as you add more plants, you build a community of plants and other organisms that support each other, share water, nutrients, and information. You're building a community. And that community is sharing resources. That's how you save water. And with the right community of plants, the garden becomes a self-assembling living system that needs less maintenance. So a native garden is actually easier to take care of than a lawn. No mowing, less water, no leaf blowing, no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides. It's basically, you know, the garden will find its level. And as you keep adding more plants, you find that some things are happy, some things are not. And you just keep adding more plants and everything will kind of underground. The roots will knit together. They'll exchange things, uh, information, nutrients, et cetera. We don't think about this very often, but plants are actually social creatures. I mean, they just socialize in ways that we don't understand. But this is the community that we want to uh, try to achieve. Uh, your goal is when you're laying out your garden, start with about 20 different species, and that's not hard to do. Um, and you're going, uh, how do I start? Well, again, consider the, the plant community. What we mean by that is it's a group of plant species living together and linked together by their effects on one another and their responses to the environment they share. Typically, the plant species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association or affinity with each other. That means they play well together. They like each other. They know each other. They're friends. And so we have a local group of plants, um, plant community that we can use here. And um, we have lots of different kinds here in Palo Alto. We don't actually have something like this, which is coastal dune ecology, where we have lupins and poppies and this beautiful Oh, love this plant, Circium occidentale, one of our native thistles. Um, and so these plants, whenever you see a blossom, you know that you have bees because bees make flowers possible. This is what they do, bees are farmers. So you want the plants in your garden to be appropriate. You want them to be the local species um, for your plant community to really make it work. So probably going to be hard to recreate this in your yard. I mean, you can plant poppies, you can't can plant the, the various thistles and lupins. Um, you know, just look for the local variety. So where do you find these plants? My go to spot where I, I just go to there are a lot of native plant resources, like National, uh, National Wildlife Federation has a native plant finder. I like to go to calscape.org because this is done by the California Native Plant Society. And uh, they have this online searchable database that has information and resources where you can find native plants, so nurseries. And then you can use, uh, you can create an Excel spreadsheet and make up a plant palette, much like a painter's palette. But this will have trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents rather than paint colors. And this is a screenshot that I took where it shows they break everything down for you, all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, and so forth. And you can look to see what plants are native to your location. So we can look for Santa Clara County. Um, you can get really specific with this, but the smaller area, um, the fewer plants there are going to be. So you want to like start countywide first. 
Um, if you don't see anything that you like in Santa Clara County, it's fine to use San Mateo or Contra Costa. So anything I think around in the Bay Area is fine uh, to use in Palo Alto. Um, so um, again, it talks about Calscape, you can contact them. They give you a planting guide, which tells you, gives you tips on how to plant these plants, as well as irrigation tips, because native plants are very particular about moisture. Um, nurseries where you can see if you find a plant that you like and you think, oh, where am I gonna find this? Click on nurseries that carry this plant, click on their website, see if they have it in their inventory. There you go. So great resources. You can have plant lists and then butterflies. What does that mean? So, and this is why I use Calscape because I'm thinking about function all the time. And so instead of what to plant, my question is, who do I feed? And so um, because of the function of plants, remember form follows function. And so I'm always thinking about like function, function, function. What is it doing, you know? and making everything work in the sort of like the machinery, although it's a living organism, it's not really a machine. Um, but my approach is very biologically based because water is how life evolved. And so, you know, it's like, so how do you make the best decisions? Make it based on biology. And biological factors are important considerations as well as those abiotic factors, the non-biological factors like climate, geology, and water use for determining what to plant. And so um, here in California, we have 1,368 species of butterflies and moths. And what they do is they give you the plants that host these particular insects. So you can go to see what, what, is, what is the Anna swallowtail like to eat? What does the painted lady like to eat? What does the common buckeye like to eat? And so on and so forth. And when you see these butterflies in the environment, you know those plants are in the environment as well because these won't these these butterflies, their caterpillars won't eat anything else. They're very picky. And so here in Palo Alto, these are the species that I have observed personally. Um, in Santa Clara County, we have 87 species of butterflies and moths. So we have everything from the Western pygmy blue butterfly. This is the smallest butterfly in North America. We have the pipe vine swallowtail. Look at the beautiful blue on that. We have the, uh, the white um, uh, skipper butterfly, a couple of different kinds. This is one at the Hopkins Gardens. We have the morning cloaks. We have the swallowtails. We have the, uh, I think this is a checker spot. We have the buckeye. Um, we have, this looks like a painted lady. And I think this is a red admiral maybe. This is just a few that I've seen, but I always like to think of butterflies as, as sort of flying flowers. I mean, as adults, they're nectaring. So people are always thinking, what can I put for nectar? And the, the adult lifespan of a butterfly is really short. The time that they spend as a, a caterpillar or a moth or a, a larva is much longer. And so consider what those larvae are eating um, and you'll end up with those butterflies. So what to plant? Where do you start? You know, it's like, I want butterflies. Great. Let's, let's figure out a sequence of what, what to plant first. So um, this is the Gwenda Street Garden. And so start with your large stuff first. Try to figure out what large plants you can fit. And what I mean by that is start with trees. Trees. Fit in as many trees as you can. And then the shrub layer. Um, the shrub layer should compose over 60% of all the plants. Focus on those evergreen shrubs just to keep that garden looking lush. And then over time, add in other things that are appropriate, like those clump grasses. Some clump grasses have roots that go down six feet into the ground. They're going to be very tough. Um, they're going to help hold the soil in place. You can add perennials. You can add native bulbs, succulents, ground covers, vines. Um, so it can become really complex and kind of almost like an English cottage garden. Um, you know, that's a look. You don't have to go for that. Um, but, you know, the more plants you add, the stronger and more resilient your garden will be. Uh, plant during late uh, fall and winter for the best results. Planting season is underway, so uh, time is now. 
I like to use the smaller plant sizes in four inch pots or one gallons or even seeds. Seeds are almost free. If you buy one plant and it gives you seeds, then you have thousands of plants for uh, the rest of time. Um, and then when you first plant, I like to use physical barriers like chicken wire um, to protect the small plants because the squirrels love freshly planted plants. They will try to dig up everything or plant acorns right next to uh, things that you recently planted. So start with those trees. And so the trees that you pick and the shrubs, so this is another uh, decision point in our toolbox. Go for those keystone plant genera. And keystone plants form the backbone of habitat resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites. Remember, um, we want those things to have as many connections as possible to other things in the environment. What we mean by a keystone, so imagine a stone arch where in the center of the arch is the keystone that's holding up the arch. It's all held by gravity. You pull out that keystone stone in the center of the arch, the arch collapses. A keystone plant species is one that has a lot of different connections to things in the environment. And so the more connections, that is the more butterfly and moth larva it feeds, the more connected it is to the environment, the more resilient it's going to be and the more resilient your garden will be. Going, why is that? Imagine a net with a lot of different threads, okay? So you can get rid of a couple of, of those threads and you still have a net. If you have a, a net with maybe two or three different strands, okay, you get rid of two, sorry, I didn't mean to flip anybody off there, then you end up with something that's going to be easily killed and not very resilient. So you want things that are going to be really connected to a lot of other things. So the takeaway technique is to use at least a few ketone, keystone plant species to provide a resilient native plant garden and to be able to really conserve that moisture. So, and trees help save water. So again, Trees are going to be a big place where water is stored, okay? Trees release water into the atmosphere, helping to cool and clean it. The, the water that is released helps form the rain cycle. So the rain that goes across the land, um, a lot of that's generated by plants, almost half of the rain cycle. Um, trees filter rainwater and slow down impacts of heavy rain, so they reduce erosion. They stabilize soil. Um, you know, and they just, they're, they're just um, insect, some are insect factories. So a lot of different things, taking bags of moisture in their, in their bodies and saving it and um, keeping everything working as it should, because, you know, plants are part of the bigger picture, part of the bigger environment. And so, for example, here's a beautiful California sister butterfly. Um, and she uh, likes to feed on the Quercus chrysolepis. This is in Foothill Park Preserve. Um, what a beautiful creature. Um, you know, oaks, this is the live oak. Here's my husband, he's six foot three inches tall for scale. So probably not gonna work in every yard, uh, but if you have a big spot where you can put in a tree like this, I would say go for it. Um, if you don't have room for a gigantic oak like that, you can put in a smaller tree like a scrub oak, which um, is um, maybe 20 feet tall, very slow growing. Um, clouds form more often over forested areas than on forested areas. So we can create our own atmosphere with a forest. Um, you know, we can create um, more moisture in the air. So, you know, it's like, so many things that biology can help with. It's very powerful. I don't think that we can overestimate the power um, that the plants have, you know, and it's all positive um, planting trees. So the cooling effects are um, of clouds and carbon dioxide captured by trees more than offset the reflection of the sun during the time when deciduous trees are bare. So, um, you know, no downside really. Um, People say, oh, I just don't want to deal with all the leaves. That's fine. Um, if you use evergreen trees and shrubs, the ones that don't lose all their leaves once a year, um, they look great. They stay green all year. You can prune them occasionally. Branches block a pathway or a sight line. Um, 
you know, shade year round. Um, oaks again, you know, no better tree really um, in terms of delivering ecosystem services. This is at the Hopkins Avenue uh, pollinator garden. The tennis courts are right over here. Um, and we transformed this little space. There was already a valley oak there, which is one of the best trees to plant. Um, used to be 61% of the tree cover in Santa Clara Valley. Um, you know, it provides critical support to everything in the ecosystem. Once those leaves drop, you want to leave them underneath the tree. Um, bumblebees will nest in those leaves. The queens overwinter there before they go out and start their new colonies. And those leaves are the nutrients that the plant has built up over the year and is fertilizing itself. And so if you take those away, it's like the tree's like, hey, I worked all year on those. That was, that was my food. Leave the leaves, just leave them where they are. And, you know, like I said, native gardens, less work. Just leave the leaves. Don't blow them because you're blowing away pupa and larva and butterflies. Just, you know, just leave them. Um, you can uh, plant more natives underneath of them. Uh, we've got a bunch of different things planted here, certainly. And, um, you know, they can live for 600 years. So, you know, uh, this plant will be your, your legacy to generations uh, to come. And they add value to real estate. So you're going, I don't have room for a big oak tree. What am I going to plant in my tiny yard? So this is where the rubber hits the road. This is my yard. And these are the trees I have planted. There's, these are a dozen native trees that are in my yard. One I did not plant, which is our street tree, the Modesto ash, <clears throat> but I planted all the rest of them. And we still have an orange tree, a plum tree, two apple trees, um, a, a mulberry tree. So we have other trees in addition to these. Some of my favorite ones that are super easy to take care of, Prunus alicifolia. If you're looking for something that's evergreen, to block the view of the neighbor's house or whatever. Prunus alicifolia, super low maintenance, super low water use, easy to, easy to grow. Another favorite, uh, Heteromelius arbutifolia, the Toyon. I planted this one and I've never watered it except for the first time I planted it. And it's just fine. So, you know, it's like, with and with five public gardens and we're probably gonna add a couple more, I'm looking to like do as little work as possible because I have a lot of different places to work. So um, these are things that I like and that work well for me. Um, you can put in uh, another favorite that I really, really like is Circocarpus petroloides, mountain mahogany, can grow in part shade. It's evergreen. It's very narrow. So if you have a, a narrow space, like in a side yard, works great. And they grow rapidly, um, super easy to grow. So, you know, again, lots of things, the Coralis cornuta, the hazelnut. If you like hazelnuts, um, they provide edible berries once they reach maturity. So, but you have to have a male and female. Um, so lots of different uh, options for trees uh, here in Palo Alto. Then you move on to your shrubs, 29 species here native to Santa Clara County, um, lush, uh, dark green glossy leaves add that lush uh, appearance to a native garden. And if you go for 75% evergreen shrubs, then it just stays green all year. So it doesn't get that dry desiccated look that some things can have. Um, some of the plants I really like, and these are in, again, in my home garden, Vaccinium obatum. This is our native huckleberry. These have edible berries on them. Remember I said I like to snack. <laughs> you can see where this is going. These are like the, the best intense blueberry tasting um, berries and they're delicious, easy to grow. The secret to this plant to make it grow fast is a little bit of cotton seed meal and they will shoot up like a foot every year. And they're just a beautiful shrub. Um, these are actually easy from seed, the coffee berry, uh, Arctostaphylus ground cover, the manzanita, Ribes viburnifolium, um, you know, just very, very lush looking all the time. Um, and then perennials, we have 53 species native to Santa Clara County. 
And so here we have a beautiful, one of our beautiful bumblebees that we have here in Palo Alto uh, landing on Visalia californica. This is super easy to grow. It's a short-lived perennial. Um, another bumblebee on Scrofularia californica. Um, I call this particular plant a, the, a threefer because it provides nectar, pollen, and it's a larval food source. So um, just a great plant uh, in the garden. So once you have your plant palette, you're, you, okay, you sheet mulched everything, you have a blank slate, how do you lay everything out? So um, before you decide on what to put where, figure out where you're going to walk. Um, you know, you might want to think about where you want to do screening or where you need shade, where you want uh, to create, you know, whatever it is that your heart desires, a little patio area. Uh, so figure out the movement areas first, because you're going to have to get through these things. And then add your plants from your plant palette as circles at their mature diameter. Uh, most circles should just touch or overlap. Remember that trees can have things planted underneath of them. Um, this will help you with spacing, with numbers. So how many of this do I need? Um, and you can do bits and pieces at a time. So you could just plant the big stuff first, come in next year and plant this, you know, this thing next, plant those next, plant those next. So, you know, don't be overwhelmed by transformation. Take it, you know, one step at a time, step by step. And eventually, you know, in maybe two or three years, your garden will be like completely transformed. It's a process. Um, you know, and to to be more patient, I mean, you can plant everything all at once if you want, which, you know, I don't say you can't do it, um, but you probably will keep adding plants over time. So that's, that's just a way to plan for where things go and the spacing is correct. Um, succulents, you know, remember I was talking about thing, uh, moisture and living tissues. Nothing is better than succulents for things, for moisture and living tissues, because the word succulent comes from the Latin word succus, meaning juice or sap. Um, so you're actually storing water in plant tissues. Um, and so plants that store water in their tissues makes them really resistant to drought and fire. So great plants to have if you live in a wildland interface. These things are not going to catch on fire because they're wet, essentially. Lots of different kinds of things that store uh, moisture in their tissues. Lots of succulents to choose from. So, you know, go to town, you know, find ones that you like. And succulents, you know, you know, we do have some local ones. But, you know, I get succulents from everywhere because I just like them. Um, I don't really worry too much about if they're not so local for our area because, you know, they're, they store moisture and moisture can be transferred around to other organisms. Um, a design tip, if you like a nice lush look um, with succulents. So get ones that don't go as dormant as some, um, like these light gray green sedums and then pair them with something darker. So that way, and this is a design tip, you get a contrast. And contrast adds a lot of visual interest, even if you don't have very many blossoms. If you let people say, oh, I just want color. Clients say that to me all the time. And it's like, do you mean things that are blooming? I don't know, color. So, you know, you have so many shades of green. You have gray greens, you have blue greens, you have yellow greens. You know, you can achieve beautiful combinations with just all the different shades of green. So this is one that actually is not a design. This was just out in nature that I discovered. And I just love the combination because we have a beautiful ground cover Arctostaphylus, the sedum coming up. We've got um, a, a cedar tree in the back and then uh, wild rose. You know, nature, she's the best designer. She gives me tips all the time. Um, and so we're almost done. Quick thing on maintenance. As I said before, native gardens are less maintenance than a non-native garden with a lawn. There's no mowing. <laughs> no mowing is required. You can mow if you want. You don't have to. Basically, what you want to do, the main work is keeping weeds at bay. 
you want to irrigate those plants that you planted to establish them, now is the best time to plant because the soil is cool and it's moist. Thank you for the rain today. Um, when you do water them though, you want to water uh, to encourage the roots to search for water. Remember, the roots are gonna be looking for goodies. And so you wanna water just outside the root ball. So those roots are gonna be seeking moisture. Um, prune sparingly to control dried up dead material for fire safety. And this is a surprise to people. You do not need to amend your soil. You, do, you don't need to fertilize at all. So money saver. Um, you can mulch to control weeds initially and help establish the plants, then mulch with leaves. Leaves are ecosystem gold. Remember, those are the nutrients that the plant spent all year creating, and then you're just bagging them up and having the gardeners take them away or throwing them in the compost bin? No, no, leave them, leave them for the plant. Um, and you can leave some areas of bare dirt for nests, uh, those bees that like to nest in the ground. Remember, 70% of native bees will do that. Do not use leaf blowers in the planted areas because you're going to be blowing a 200 mile an hour wind onto larva and you're going to be desiccating them. The whole point here is to save moisture. So if you do use a leaf blower, use it to clean off the hardscape, the patios, the driveways, the sidewalks, but it's really not necessary in a planted area. Um, if you feel like your plants are getting smothered and I resist the temptation to uh, clean off the plants. Because I like less maintenance, I let the leaves stay on top of plants unless they're completely buried. I might brush them off a little bit, but I'm not like picking out all the leaves because the leaves will decay and the plants will come up through the leaves. And don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. So again, it, a native plant garden is actually doing more by doing less. So super easy to take care of. Um, I remember one of the goals amongst other goals in terms of saving that moisture in tissues where it does the best good um, is to avoid creating that ecological trap because this is that other part. Now that I've planted my native garden, what happens? So this is the part where you're developing your relationship with it. You will see things come flying out when you water, if you're doing it right, wings everywhere of moths and butterflies and bees. Um, because that's their home and that's their food, um, your garden is going to be very attractive to these insects. And so you don't want something to uh, kill off these organisms so that they can't complete their life cycle. So they can't mate, they can't nest, they can't reproduce. Okay, like outdoor light at night. Um, blackout curtains in windows is very good. You can use yellow lights at night um, or you can put motion sensors on your lights. You do not need outdoor light at night for security. There's, uh, there, you can use mo motion sensors instead. Uh, motion sensors are just great. Uh, if the lights aren't on all the time, it doesn't actually deter crime. It's, I used to be a lighting designer, so that's actually a thing. Um, so, you know, reduce that light pollution at night. Birds actually migrate at night, and so you want to keep that down. Uh, leave the leaves, again, reduce the use of the pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, and then try to use uh, electrical uh, equipment if you need to do um, any sort of uh, uh, maintenance work that requires a machine. So finally, <laughs> now that we got to the end here, so we talked a lot about function and decision-making and kind of like these broad concepts for how do you decide what to do. And this is a very personal decision for people. What's going to work for you? And so consider that, make lists, make some, you know, designs on paper, use graph paper, makes it easier. Um, and so as you're doing this transformation, the more eco, among the other ecosystem services and saving money on water and maintenance, the more that you understand these interrelationships in nature, you will learn how to optimize the productivity of your native plant garden. And that will lead to an abundance of life, as well as the enhancement of your appreciation and your role in caring for nature's complex beauty. 
as well as saving water. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Juanita. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. I am going to, or in the, I'm going to put a survey link in the chat. So if everyone, if you have a chance to um, fill that out and let us know what additional class topics you're interested, how this went, please fill that out. Okay, Juanita, we have a lot of questions from Mary. Um, let's see, they're asking, how do you think about allergens? with um, native plants and keeping that in mind. And also if you're familiar with the UC Verde buffalo grass. Um, I'm not really familiar with the buffalo grass, um, but that could be, that could be looked up. Um, I do get a question about allergens a lot and um, people are very worried about that. So the, the thing about um, flowering plants is that they are not wind pollinated. Wind pollinated plants do not rely on pollinators to move pollen around. Um, and so when you have insects moving pollen around, that pollen is not available to, to go into your nose. Um, there are some plants that are wind pollinated, but flowering plants that have blossoms on them in general um, don't spew their pollen out. Um, in such a way that it is, it enhances allergies. Now, if you put your face into a plant and sniff the flowers and stuff like that, chances are you may breathe in some pollen, um, but pollen is being moved around by insects. So that's one thing. If you have not an allergy to the pollen, but to the various uh, plant uh, genus, some people are allergic to certain things. I mean, people are allergic to poison ivy, right? Poison oak. Even though it's a great habitat plant, it's not one that I would recommend for a regular residential garden. So you have to think about if you have like a contact um, allergy with the with that plant, don't plant those particular uh, that particular genus or species. Um, there are some plants um, that have little irritating hairs on them that um, they're protective mechanisms, like the Fremont and Dendron, uh, which even with garden gloves, those little hairs can actually go through the garden gloves unless they're leather. Um, so there are plants certainly that you don't get too close to. Um, but you know, again, if you if you pick a plant that has blooms on it, um, chances are the pollen is not going to be contributing to an allergy because of because of wind. Um, but it might be that you might have an allergy if you get up close to it. So again, um, you know. Pick, pick, pick plants that you know specifically that you're not allergic to, but, but take some comfort in the non-wind pollinated plants are not really contributing to the overall uh, pollen load in the, in the air. Great. We have a good question from Judy about um, what do you recommend for watering? Can you talk a little bit more about the different irrigation techniques? Yes. So that was part of what we we're going to do. So, um, you know, I, <laughs> whenever I design irrigation, I'm always fighting uh, with squirrels because squirrels will chew through any sort of plastic. So anytime I can hide things from squirrels so they can't get to it, I use it. So a pop-up microspray um, is a good one. And a microspray is actually, um, really easy to use. I think Rainbird makes these where there's a spaghetti tube that goes to a pop-up that's buried in the ground. And when you turn the system on, um, the spaghetti tube, which is put into a, a plastic lateral pipe, you punch a hole in the, in the pipe and you stick in a spaghetti tube and that goes to your pop-up micro spray. And that can be very specific. And you can use something like that kind of system to, uh, water things um, initially. You want to have, um, let's say you have a valve for a certain area. In that one area, you want to have plants that are all the same water use. Okay, you don't want to mix high water use with low water use plants. 
because the low water use plants aren't going to like it um, if you water that area for the high water use plants. If you water for the low water use plants, the high water use plants will die. So design your areas so that the plants all have the same plant factor, okay, whether it's very low, low, medium, or high. Um, so the pop-up microspray is a good one. Um, the kind of irrigation that we have it at the um, our various gardens, and it, these these places were, um, you know, parkway medians that had existing irrigation, and so in many of the gardens, I'm not sure too much about primrose whether we have the uh, high efficiency rotors, but we do have them at I believe the Hopkins Garden, the Gwynda Street Garden, and there's a new garden that's going in where it's a pop-up waterer, but it's not a spray, like a fixed spray, which spews out a ton of water in a mist, which is not good. Um, but these are like a high efficiency rotor that puts out little individual streams of water, takes a little bit longer, but you end up with these big drops of water coming out so that, you know, they can, the water can sink in. So that's another thing that I like to use. And, um, I also do a lot of hand watering um, because I have a small yard. So this is for my own residential garden. I have a small yard. I do have, um, I am gonna, I, like in my meadow area, that's on a spray. And I'm, I'm converting that to the high efficiency rotor because you know I water maybe once a week, um, you know, for 10 minutes or something like that. And, to know that you're getting enough water into these areas, when you have a system like that, put rain gauges out. And you can get rain gauges on Amazon. They're just these little plastic cups with marks telling you half inch, inch, two inches, so forth. And you can see if you're getting enough water to these plants. Um, you know, is it a quarter inch enough? And you can also come in with a soil moisture sensor, stick it in there you know, into the, where the roots are, see what the soil uh, moisture is. Um, if you're watering by hand, I would say, you know, look at your soil moisture, make sure you're not watering on the hot days. You don't want to, and we can't actually water in Palo Alto during uh, daytime hours uh, before, I think it's before nine o'clock is fine. And, to, and then after like five or six or something like that. So water when the soil is cool. You don't want hot, wet soil because that increases diseases. So um, those are the systems that I like the best. I like to, you know, some people do drip irrigation with emitters. Um, I've always found those to be problematic because they're plastic. And no matter how many times I repair an emitter, the squirrels will go and chew that thing up because they're looking for water. And even if I haven't watered, they still, chew, they still chew up the emitters. And so you end up with a lot of pieces of plastic everywhere. Um, so if you wanna use a drip emitter, you're gonna to have to put a cage over it to keep the squirrels from getting to it until the plants are established. And then, you know, maybe you can get away without watering as much and take the, the cage away and hopefully the squirrels aren't going to eat things. There's almost no way to keep the squirrels from eating the plastic. You know, I'm totally at my wits end. That's why I like the pop-up uh, method because they can't get to those um, very well. So, uh, so those are all techniques that I like to use. There's not a one size fits all. It really depends on what plants you have. Um, you know, you can do bubblers next to trees that, um, it's a great way to, to water trees as well. And bubblers are just like these little valves where water comes out right next to the tree. And those are not plastic. Um, you can have emitters that come up from one stub and then have like eight spaghetti tubings coming off. Again, those are gonna be chewed up, but there are a lot of different ways to get water to plants. Um, you know, in some places, one of our projects that we have uh, that we're doing, the Embarcadero Road Pollinator Corridor Project, we're trying to connect the Primrose Garden to the Gwynda Street Garden. One section of that did not get watered all summer. 
and the plants are still alive. We planted, and I did this on purpose because I didn't know, and that, that place does not have irrigation. We planted uh, ceanothus, some salvias, um, and some arctostaphylus. And those plants are super low water use. We had, we had gotten them established. we have been hand watering them um, you know, once a week for like a year. And um, they were so well established and nicely mulched that they lived this whole last summer with, they might've gotten water once, I think. So, um, you know, I was very happy to see that the plants are still alive because I didn't personally take care of it. I was a student taking care of it. Um, anyway, the plants lived, it's all good. Um, and so, you know, I mean, you can, you can really, once plants are established, kind of starve them of water. And especially if they're <clears throat> the really low water use plants, um, they'll be fine. And then once it cools down, like it is now, um, this is the active growing season. So, um, you know, then you can get back to helping them uh, get those roots in there even more, you know, watering really deeply um, so that the water is going deep down into the soil. Um, another technique, and this is not with an irrigation system, but um, remember I talked about how plants share water. And so um, there are some grasses that I mentioned have roots that go way down. Those grasses will actually help direct water into the soil. Other plants with tap roots reach down into the groundwater, pump the water up, and with their lateral roots, spread it out. And these are all techniques that are talked about on that CalScape site that I mentioned before, where they talk about, um, you know, the planting guide, all those sorts of um, biological methods are are sort of spelled out there. So you know, again, it's not a one size fits all. It's like, you know, what are you planting? <clears throat> um, you know, what's your level of comfort with hand watering? Um, where can you get water to things? You know, but hopefully amongst all of these different techniques, there's something that will work for you. Great, Juanita. Um, we have a couple more questions. How close can you plant shrubs next to the house? Will it attract ants if it is too close? So um, ants are clean, the, the cleanup crew um, in a, uh, a garden. And sometimes ants like things that have a very sticky nectar to them. Um, what I would recommend for the ant thing, because ants are not my favorite insects because I don't like them to crawl on me and I've had plenty of that happen, um, is to observe the plants to see which ones have ants crawling on them. Sometimes it's the nectar, sometimes they have aphids on them and the aphids secrete um, a, a nice nectary, sweet, sticky substance that the ant, that the ants like. Um, I I don't really worry too much about ants on plants because, um, you know, as long as they're not crawling on me, that's fine. And they do clean up dead insects. That's their kind of their role. Um, and the aphids are basically the sh the soft shelled crab of the insect world. A lot of things eat a lot of things eat aphids, so I don't worry about that. So in terms of planting close to the house, it depends. Um, you can go with something that's very low, so it's not gonna be up against the house. So it's gonna be difficult if you wanted to paint your house, for example. Um, if you think about the wall here, and then your plant at its mature diameter, don't plant it right here. Think about that mature diameter. So find the center of where that plant is gonna be when it's mature. And then, so think about that diameter and then the wall being over here somewhere. So you can, don't, don't put it too close is the answer. Um, you know, especially if you have something that's gonna get sort of large is you want it to be a little further away from the house. I always like to have space in between because of maintenance issues with any sort of structure. Um, you know, if you, if you wanna plant a tree close to the house, remember trees drop leaves and branches into gutters and they also fall over. So, you know, again, what's gonna work best for you? You have to think about how do you wanna maintain your property? 
create. If you want to replace the lawn with native grasses, do you sheet mulch the current lawn and let it die before reseeding, or is there another way? I think I would do that. Um, and, um, you know, I would sheet mulch and kind of let, let all that cardboard smother whatever is there. Um, you know, give it a year. Um, so this would not be an instant thing. If you wanted to do like the sod, a native sod blend, I would wait a year. Um, and then once that's years over, um, have a native sod installed and you can just like um, peel back everything to get to the bare soil so that you can, you can get the sod on there. Or you can um, maybe try doing plugs um, into the, the sheet mulching of different native grasses. That's a little bit more problematic because some of the grasses that are underneath are going to be like they can see the hole, right, and want to come up. And so you'll have to like move the native grass while you're pulling out bits and pieces of the, um, the non-native lawn. So that can be problematic. Or you can just not, not water it at all during the summer, let it completely die, and then plant your native plants and, and your grasses at that time. Um, if you don't want to do, I mean, if you really want to go super low work, just let the lawn completely die uh, by not watering it during the summertime. And by that time, it, you know, after a year or so, and it's completely dead, then you're good. So a lot of different ways to go with that one. Uh, we have a question. If you have any advice for a good um, irrigation equipment store. An irrigation equipment store. Um, boy, you know, I've, I've looked at various um, home improvement stores for equipment. I tend to order things online. Um, I, I like the Rainbird stuff, uh, which I've used in the past. It's usually what I specify. And I just order online um, from them because, you know, they probably have everything that you need um, rather than going to a store and then kind of digging through the equipment. Um, you know, you can research it ahead of time and see if some of those, those places do. I know that there are some irrigation supply stores around. I just uh, don't go to those. Great. Um, I see one more question. If I seed grass, should I till it to help? Shall she do what? Uh, till it. Ah, um, you don't really have to till it. I don't like to myself. I don't like to break up the soil structure. And so what I'll do is if I in between the clumps of already things that I have growing, um, I will just, I mean, I am the laziest gardener you've ever met. I will throw grass seed right on the ground and just barely cover it with maybe a little potting soil on the top. And I do that because I don't want the birds to eat it. Sometimes I don't even do that. Sometimes I'll just throw more seed out there than I need um, because that's just how lazy I am. Um, so. And that has worked really well. I've been very surprised to see actually, you know, I, and I'm always trying to find ways like, what's the least amount of work I can actually do here and it's still gonna grow. And that has actually worked for me. And so before it rained, I had a little bit left over of the Festuca rubra. I just chucked it out into the bare spots. It rained today, it's gonna rain a few more days this week, so. You know, I'm not going to do anything else. Um, I know we still have 11 people on the call in the class, so I'll give another minute or two for questions and feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask Bonita directly. Um, we do have one question that just came in. If my lawn has been dead for over a year now, should I still sheet mulch? Um, if it's completely dead, no. I mean, if you want to try to keep weeds down, um, you know, because when you start, you know, I mean, you'll spot water things depending on how you do it. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, keep weeds down, sheet mulching is good. But 
you know, I don't, I personally don't like to do a lot of sheet mulching myself. I'll do it in, in patches because I want to be able to have those bees that are nesting in the ground to like emerge in the springtime because they, you know, it's amazing just how many species will, will nest where you least expect it. And so I'm always very aware that I'm, you know, if I'm, even if it breaks down over time, um, it's still creating a barrier for organisms to get through. Um, and so if you, if you don't need to sheet mulch and, you know, if your lawn is dead, I would say, don't, don't bother. Um, I would just use just regular mulch instead and not bother with the cardboard because of the barrier aspect, especially if you, if there are any organisms that need to emerge from there. Um, and it also saves a step. Remember, laziest gardener in the world. So the less work, the better. Great. I don't see any other questions in the Q&A box. Um, give it one more minute. Yes, and I would encourage everybody to, um, you know, visit our gardens, um, you know, maybe a couple of times a year to see how things look like in April when everything is blooming and it looks pretty amazing. And then again in September when everything is like dry, you know, and see, you know, which things look more dry than others and which things still look pretty lush. And, you know, it's all a matter of aesthetics. The things that I like may not be the same things that other people like. So it's like, you know, if you see something that you like, you know, plant it it's really not hard to do. And also to check out the, um, the demonstration gardens that are around um, there, you know, I mentioned the one at Eleanor Party Park, but there are a lot of other native plant gardens to check out. And the California Native Plant Society has a going native garden tour that they do um, in late April, early May. And private individuals open up their gardens for people to come and visit. Um, and that's a great way to see how a native plant garden can look in a residential setting. Um, and some are just spectacular and you, you would never guess. Um, you would say, oh, these are natives. They all look so, I mean, my gardens are more habitat. And so look a little bit, I wouldn't say messy. Maybe I would use the word complex, but there's some gardens that, that don't, that are more, a little bit more formal, a little bit more con constrained, you know? And so you can have native plants um, in, in a lot of different styles, formal styles, informal styles, cottage garden, and so forth. Are there any of the clovers a replacement for grass native to California? Yes, there are uh, a number of different clover species. Most are annuals. And the thing with clovers um, is that they tend to get eaten by snails and slugs. Um, and the only time I, I tend, I don't use sluggo in any of the public gardens, but in my own home garden, if I want to keep the slugs off of the clovers, because I love clover, I use um, sluggo, takes care of the issue. Um, there is one clover that is a perennial, which is Trifolium wormskiodii, and um, that one's wonderful. It's more of a dune sort of plant. It grows out on the beach and the coastal uh, prairies, um, but that one has a beautiful pink flower. Um, so, you know, clovers are great. They don't, um, they, you know, as I said, most of them are annual plants. And when I do grow them because of the slug issue and the snail issue, I grow them in pots. Some are quite rare because of the snails and the slugs. So I encourage people to grow them um, in pots. In fact, I like to, to layer plants in pots. So I make even the pots complex. So clover, annual clover underplanted, you know, with some other plant in a pot is a great way to get that clover fix. Um, you know, there's one that's not local to here that I really like. It's a yellow clover. I think it's Trifolium uh, jokestersii which is a, yellow, a beautiful yellow blossom, which you, you know, it's like, wow, I have to have that one. Um, that one seeds itself uh, pretty readily. So it's like, there are some 
when people talk about local things, sometimes I'll get seeds of things that are not local. And then if they like extra moisture and I have plants in a pot that like extra moisture, I'll put those seeds in that, that pot. So I get like a twofer out of that single pot. And then I get seeds again for the next year and I can kind of control what the wildlife does um, to some degree. Um, but yes, the answer is yes, there are some clovers that are native, but most are annual plants. Great. Well, thank you so much, Juanita. And thank you everyone for joining us and for staying on for the Q&A. I don't see any additional questions. So thank you. Have a good night. Um, we will be hosting more webinars next season. Thanks, Linda.